So hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Yanni Lin, and on behalf of the Asian American Bar Association Civil Rights Committee, welcome to today's event, We Belong. And thank you to the Jonathan Logan Family Foundation for this incredible space. It is our hope today that the speakers you'll hear from, as well as the exhibit itself, will be thought-provoking, informative, and galvanizing. It's now my honor to introduce Don Tamaki, the first speaker. Don's parents and extended family were incarcerated first in the horse stalls of Tanfran Racetrack in San Bruno, which had been converted to a temporary prison camp, then at Topaz Concentration Camp in Utah. A graduate of UC Berkeley and UC Berkeley School of Law, he is a managing partner of the law firm Manami Tamaki LLP. With roots in the legal nonprofit sector, Don helped found the Asian Law Alliance in San Jose and served as the executive director of the Asian Law Caucus in San Francisco. He continues providing services to community groups today. From 1983 to 1985, he served on the legal team, which reopened the landmark Supreme Court case, Korematsu versus United States which overturned Fred Korematsu's criminal convictions for refusing to be incarcerated. The reopening was based on newly discovered evidence from the Justice Department, War Department, Navy, FBI, and FCC, admitting that Japanese Americans had committed no wrong and posed no threat. Other Justice Department memoranda characterized the Army's claims that Japanese Americans were spying as intentional falsehoods. These official reports were never presented to the court because they were intentionally suppressed, altered, or destroyed so as to manipulate the outcome of the Korematsu decision. The Korematsu legal team worked with Akin Gump in filing an amicus brief in Trump versus Hawaii to remind the court and the public of the perils to democracy when courts blindly defer to government's unsubstantiated claim that national security justifies curtailment of fundamental liberties. On June 26, 2018, the court upheld the travel ban. And in a blistering dissent, Justice Sonia Sotomayor cited the amicus brief. Don helped lead public awareness campaign aptly named Stop Repeating History and speaks regularly at events like this one. Please join me in welcoming Don Tamaki. Thank you for uh, being here. Really appreciate it. I'm glad that um, the Asian American Bar Association sponsored this and was able to feed everyone. Uh, my understanding is that the food actually got delivered to 100 Montgomery Street in the financial district. So I'm glad it actually uh, made its way here. I want to thank the Asian American Bar Association for doing this. Thank you, Yanni. Thank you, Lisa Mack. Thank you, Teresa. Um, thank you uh, all who were involved in, in putting this together. I'm so happy that in the, among the crowd there are young people here because I think this is an important uh, lesson not only to know historically but going forward. Um, right here was ground zero for the, uh, the designing and the implementation of the rounding up of almost 120,000 Americans of Japanese ancestry, two-thirds who were like my parents, born, actually born in this country, American citizens by birth. And um, in 19, December 7th, 1941, as you all know, Japan attacked Pearl Harbor. And uh, uh, literally the next day, this, the Secret Service and the FBI swept into San Francisco, Oakland, Portland, Los Angeles, Seattle, all up and down the West Coast and began arresting uh, community leaders, Japanese school teachers, martial arts, arts instructors, Buddhist and Shinto priests. And those people were literally taken away uh, immediately. And their families did not know where they were or, where, where, uh, or when they were, would see them again. Um, at that time, uh, February 19th, uh, 1942, the President Roosevelt signed Executive Order 9066 and uh, it declared uh, this entire area of the West Coast, uh, obviously here, and um, the states of Washington, Oregon, California, southern half of Arizona, 
and it's under the jurisdiction of a military commander by the name of John L. DeWitt, uh, based here in the Presidio. And together, he, along with his uh, lieutenant, uh, Carl Bedetson, Stanford-educated lawyer, basically hatched out a program, first to begin with curfew, that Japanese Americans uh, could not leave their houses after 8 p.m. at night, had to stay there till 6 in the morning. And literally, within a week or two, uh, the rounding up occurred in which orders to report to uh, what was called euphemistically as assembly centers, where actually they were temporary prison camps. And uh, uh, in this area, it was San Bruno Tanferan Racetrack, now a shopping center, uh, but at that time was a racetrack. They surrounded it with barbed wire and machine gun towers. And all the folks in Oakland, San Francisco, this entire Bay Area, were herded into horse stalls. And uh, to this day, I keep my father's diploma from the University of California at Berkeley. He was about to graduate, and uh, he was sent off. And uh, the diploma was sent to him. I keep, it was scrolled in a mailing tube. And it said, uh, Tanferan Assembly Center, Barrack 29, Apartment 5. And you can imagine what Apartment 5 was. It was a horse stall. And uh, if, if you've ever been around horses or uh, far, farm animals, you know, this is a unheated, you know, stall, manure, straw on the floor, uh, no heat, no electricity. Uh, that was where they lived until um, 10 more permanent concentration camps were constructed from here, from California to Arkansas. Three uh, individual, individuals didn't cooperate with him. One of them was Gordon Hirabayashi of the Bay Area. Another was, excuse me, Fred Kormatsu of the Bay Area, Gordon Hirabayashi, uh, a student at Seattle, University of Washington. And Minoru Yasui had just graduated from law school, the University of Oregon Law School. And the government defended this entire program on the grounds that Japanese Americans were engaging in spying and espionage. Uh, you know, they were being disloyal to the country. There was only one thing wrong with that claim. It was completely made up. And uh, when we walk out and, and take a look at the tour, I'll talk about uh, the evidence that every intelligence agency had said that what the Army was claiming was uh, intentional falsehoods and fabrications. And there was this debate within the Justice Department as to whether those reports and facts were to be disclosed to uh, the US Supreme Court. Well, fast forward to um, June of 2018, when this Supreme Court upheld the so-called travel ban, banning uh, travel of, uh, from uh, five Muslim majority countries. And um, as in 1943 and 44, uh, the government defended the travel ban, the shutdown of the country, of Muslims entering the country, on the grounds that uh, it makes the country safer. Uh, it cited a global uh, intelligence report of the Homeland Security, but when the court asked for the re report and be able to see it, uh, the, the government refused to disclose it. When that case was decided last year, uh, five to four decision, the court upheld the travel ban. It continues to separate families, American families today. And um, uh, the government essentially, the court essentially took the government's word for it that this actually makes the country safer. And no one asked then and uh, today, and no one asked in 1944 or 1943 uh, whether this, this was a, a, a necessity whether it did, in fact, make the country safer, or whether it was, in fact, uh, instead the fulfillment of bigoted uh, campaign promises and uh, racist policies. And so, unfortunately, that's what makes this exhibit so relevant today. Why does this all matter? Well, it matters because uh, this president has sent literally thousands of troops uh, to terrorize a distant group of migrants at the border. It matters because um, uh, ch children have been separated from their parents, as you know. Uh, six children to date have died in ICE custody. 
Um, we talk about people being put in horse stalls, uh, people being are being held in detention centers uh, with children as if they were animals. I mean, these are facilities designed to hold um, adult uh, uh, males mainly, and concrete floors, uh, no beds, um, and uh, people are housed indefinitely under, under those conditions. Um, it matters because last year, um, the president ordered the deportation of over 300,000 people who've been here for over 10 years, from, who are uh, from Somalia, they're from El Salvador, they're from Haiti, uh, and other country, uh, countries, granted temporary protective status because of war or natu natural disasters. And suddenly, uh, the government has taken the position that those people ought to be support, uh, deported, uh, which would you know, rip families apart. And um, uh, Judge, uh, Federal District Court Judge Edward Chen, here in San Francisco, who was on, actually on the legal Korematsu team in reopening the cases that Yanni uh, described, uh, basically uh, uh, cited uh, Trump's um, uh, claims that a Haitians have, have AIDS, that Mexican uh, uh, are uh, drug dealers and rapists, that Nigerians would never go back to Africa to their, their huts, and uh, why can't we have more people from Norway? These are quotes, I'm not making this stuff up, uh, at a, uh, uh, a, a joint briefing on immigration that he made before, before other congressional leaders. So that's why it matters, and in particular for Asian Americans who are sponsoring the, this event, I, I would say to us that we have something to say about this. Why? Because we have seen this before. Uh, the legal uh, tradition of the courts not asking any questions when the government invokes national security uh, and deferring to the government uh, in the cases of national security, that actually started in 1882 with the Chinese Exclusion Act, one of the first travel bans in this country. It was reaffirmed in Korematsu versus the United States. The, the court simply accepted the government's word for it, that this roundup that you're about to learn about uh, was necessary for the nation's safety. It was reaffirmed in Trump versus Hawaii, uh, the so-called travel ban. And some of the worst elements of the Korematsu case basically became imported into Korematsu versus uh, the United States. And uh, it's happening, you know, we're living in an atmosphere where I would say most of the categories that account for our presence here in the United States, I'm talking about family re reunification, birthright citizenship, uh, refugees status, all of those are under attack. Refugee visas have been cut by more than half. Where would Asian Americans of Southeast Asian descent fleeing from war and violence uh, in Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia, where we, you know, they would not be here. Their families would either be locked up or might even be dead. Uh, family reunification uh, resulting from the reforms in 1960s, that accounts for most Asian Americans in this country. You know what that's being called? Chain migration. And people being born here. I mean, my, fa my grandfather was a stowaway, paid a ship's cook to hide him from, in the pantry from, on a steamer from Hawaii to Eureka, came down, established the family in San Francisco, making my father uh, anchor, an anchor baby. You know, even birthright citizenship is under attack. So what does that make me, literally? So I think uh, the point is, I'm gonna quote Charles Jung here, that for Asian Americans, you know, we may think, we may think we're not the migrants on the border, we're not the brown people being held uh, in detention camps. Uh, but if we look back into our own history, and the exhibit is a good illustration of that, or maybe one or two degrees of separation from the people that are being targeted currently today. And I would say that for all Americans, it's not just Asian Americans, that's for the rest of us too, everybody in this room, because if you trace back your ancestry to how you got here, 
uh, you're going to fall into one of those immigration categories, probably under attack right now. So what we're witnessing is basically a redefining of what it is to be an American. And that's why this exhibit is so important. So I really appreciate Asian American Bar Association for putting on this event. I appreciate your presence. After uh, a couple of talks here, I'm going to lead a docent tour and explain some of the images that you will see. So thank you very much.